Uh, my name is Doug French, in case you've lost your programs, and I'm with the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Of course, that's not why Hans asked me to speak on this topic. I'm actually an ex-banker. I used to make real estate loans, construction loans, in one of those sand states that Steve Saylor talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, I was a lender in Las Vegas for over 20 years and uh, very much a contributor to the, uh, to the boom and the bust, as it turns out. So thankfully, I've found a place to land, but uh, this speech will have a lot to do with my past experiences. But I first want to talk about legitimate banking. Not that I have a lot of experience with legitimate banking, <laughs> but legitimate banking is based on honoring property rights, which seems appropriate for this conference. And if you put money in a de um, make a deposit into a bank, into what we would call a checking account, that person is not trading a present good for a future good. When you put money in the bank, it, you still believe it's your bank or your money. The bank is just warehousing it for you. And the deposit's not a loan. You're not giving it to the bank for a certain amount of time to be returned uh, later to you. It's available all the time. You could put it in one day and get it the very next afternoon. That's the understanding. The bank's supposed to guard, protect, and return the money at a moment's notice. But unfortunately, bankers, being men and women, they're subject to temptation. Temptation to commit theft, temptation to commit fraud, and the warehousing profession's been no different. And short of just stealing depositor stuff, or in the case of money, the warehouseman borrows the money temporarily, to profit by speculation or whatever and return the money later prior to when the depositor needs to withdraw it. And of course this is called embezzlement, which the, definition, uh, the dictionary defines as appropriating fraudulently to one's own use as money or property entrusted in one's care. And essentially that's what modern fractionalized banking is. And of course, nothing is more tempting than gold coin back in the days of the goldsmiths or money now, cash money, uh, for embezzlement because these items are fully fungible. And they found that this is very profitable to create money out of nowhere. So bankers and governments have found that it would be very important to find an adequate theoretical justification beyond the easy solution of just simply declaring legal a corrupt criminal practice that's ultimately happened. Now, there's a number of court cases down through history that uh, has made this all legal. But really what uh, what's reminds me of this is a movie, a John Wayne movie, called The Common Charos. And I don't know if any of you have seen it. But there's a character in there, a great character played by Edgar Buchanan, Circuit Court Judge Thaddeus Jackson Breen. And he tells Paul Regret, played by Stuart Whitman, Major here has told me what your problems are. I've been thinking it over, and in light of my 40 years' experience in legal jurisprudence, I have come to the positive conclusion that there ain't no way to do this legal and honest. Being sensible Texans, we'll do it illegal and dishonest. <laughs> and I think that sums up how banks and governments have come together to make law very ambiguous, deliberately ambiguous, to legally justify fractional reserve banking. Because ultimately, fractional reserves cannot survive economically. They must be supported by government force. They must be supported by a central bank. 
which institutes the regulations and supplies the liquidity at all times to prevent the entire apparatus from collapsing. Now, banking crises are as old as history. And in fact, for those of you who are going to Ephesus on Tuesday, there was actually a crisis uh, that occurred over 2,000 years ago. I don't know what the name of the bank is. It's probably Ephesus State Bank or something like that. (laughs) But this crisis motivated authorities to grant the banking industry its first express historically documented privilege, which established a 10-year deferment on the return of deposits. So as you're walking around Ephesus, look for evidence of uh, some collapsed bank. But there was an attempt in 1609 to return to 100% reserves. And it's called the Bank of Amsterdam. Very famous bank. And they maintained reserves for a number of years. And in fact, uh, many historians, uh, many economists believe that they, they uh, scrupulously fulfilled the commitment to have 100% reserves for 150 years. Now, there's some dispute about this. And some historians believe that um, they actually, the Bank of Amsterdam actually surreptitiously made some loans to the East Indian Company uh, from their vast pool of deposits. In other words, the Bank of Amsterdam, as much as they tried to maintain 100% deposits, again, succumbed to uh, the notion that uh, they should loan out this money. And the man who learned about that was a guy that was on the lam from the law, John John Law, actually. He had uh, killed a man in a duel in his native Scotland and uh, had been tried and been found guilty, and they were going to uh, hang him for murder. Uh, So he was able to escape, and he he, uh, was a theoretical thinker uh, on monetary issues and traveled around Europe, and he actually went to the Bank of Amsterdam, and he discovered that uh, the Bank of Amsterdam had made this loan to the East Indian Company. And as John uh, John T. Flynn writes, law perceived with clarity that this bank, in its secret violation of its charter, had actually invented a method of creating money. So John Law really was the Keynes, 200 years before Keynes was even born. And John Law went throughout Europe as he gambled, he partied every night, and uh, had a, he was a tremendous gambler, made his money that way. But he was constantly seeking a government to try his system of creating paper money. And he finally found that... Uh, he found that country in, the, uh, in France in the early 1700s. And he started a bank called the General Bank. And of course, he was smart enough to own it 25% by him, 75% with the king. So he cut the king in on the deal, and away they went. He created money, vast forms of money. He started other companies, which became uh, the Mississippi system. Of course, ultimately, within two years of the system, he knew he needed to make the general bank the royal bank. He needed government force to keep the system in place. But ultimately, the the system collapsed, and uh, he did everything he could by decree to keep people from moving their money the Royal Bank into gold and silver. He confiscated gold and silver. Uh, He did all he could to keep the system in place. But eventually, an outraged French public forced the regent to place uh, law under house arrest, and he, in fact, died in near poverty. In fact, uh, the Mississippi bubble, the bursting of the Mississippi bubble, was so immense and the loss is so heavy that it was considered a faux pas in France to even utter the word bank for over a hundred years. The term was, at the time, synonymous with the word fraud. 
Now, I want to fast forward very quickly to the United States and how banking in the United States has deteriorated over over the last 50-some years. And um, the reason I'm wearing this fancy suit that I had made in Hong Kong by my tailor, Sammy, as opposed to my American tailor, Joseph A. Bank. But, um, you know, bankers used to wear suits. They used to be very prim and proper in the 50s. And that was about the time, actually at the end of 1954, National Citibank, which was, uh, which was a predecessor to today's Citicorp, it had $6.3 billion in assets, of which $5 million was lent out on real estate loans. Only $5 million of $6.3 billion. It's half, a tenth of 1%. And while all loans were only $2.3 billion, in other words, their loan-to-deposit ratio was only 41%. So in the 50s, despite practicing fractionalized banking, in America, bankers were pretty conservative. When they wore a suit to work, and they were very tight with credit, and they would certainly not in, in, make loans from deposits on long-term assets such as real estate, or not very often anyway. Now, when I started in banking in 1957, 51% of all loans with U.S. banks were real estate loans. It's a huge change from less than 1% of loans being made on real estate in the 50s. By 40 years later, over half were made on real estate loans. Of course, in 1997, at least when I started, uh, bankers were still wearing suits. But in, uh, in the early 1990s and, and early 2000s, that's when dressing casual during the week became very prevalent. And I know at the bank that I worked at, we started wearing suits four days a week when I started. And, of course, in Las Vegas, it's hot, so you can create all kinds of reasons not to wear a suit. But as we made more money and we thought we were very smart because all our loans were paying off and the real estate bubble was going great, we didn't figure we needed to dress up to do this anymore. So first, we had casual Fridays. Then, we had casual every day in the summer. Summer being defined from May to October. Well, then we'd redefine summer. Summer became, uh, began in March and went all the way to December, which means we dressed up for two months out of the year. Then we decided we can dress casual every day except board meetings. When the board showed up, we should probably dress up. But then by that time, things were going so good that we didn't care what the board thought. <laughs> So we dressed up, or we, we had casual day every day, even during board days. And then casual wasn't enough. It was casual except for Fridays, and then you could wear jeans. Of course, the next thing that happened, unfortunately, is uh, the bank was seized by the FDIC, and everybody was unemployed. So presumably they could dress casually every every single day. <laughs> By the end of 2008, the loan deposit ratio for all banks, and remember back in 1954, uh, National Citibank had lent out 41% of its deposits. Still very liquid, something that, that Guido mentioned. By 2008, the loan to deposit ratio for all banks was 87%. So virtually, you take all your deposits and you lend it out because it's very, very profitable. And by the end of 2008, 60% of all loans were secured by real estate. So what we have is very casually dressed bankers um, lending out all their deposits on real estate loans. And it was good while the boom was happening. 
1991, total bank assets were $4.5 trillion. By the end of 2008, those bank assets were $13.8 trillion, essentially a tripling, more than a tripling. So you, it, you might assume that, gee, there was a lot of savings. Americans must have been saving like crazy if bank assets were uh, going up that far. But actually, the savings rate fell from 7% to negative half a percent the peak of the housing boom in 2006. So it's rebounded somewhat since then, and now we have this annoying uh, parade of Keynesian now complaining about the paradox of thrift right now. But um, we can see that this wasn't savings that were driving these bank loans and bank deposits. It was actually money being created out of nowhere through the banking system. So nobody was saving. Casually ban uh, addressed bankers were making all kinds of loans and being paid like used car salesmen. And as with the help of the Fed, expanding bank assets out of nowhere. And this was all based on real estate values that were essentially, as we found out later, to be an illusion. And I saw Donald Trump recently on television and he was telling the story about old-time mortgage bankers earning a small salary, and the only bonus they'd receive is a turkey at Christmas, around holiday time. But in the last few years, he said, bankers have been on commission. Some of them make $50, $60 million a year. They don't even get paid when the loan pays off, but when the loan is funded. Well, that's exactly right. That's the way we, that's the way we uh, were paid, was on commission when things got hot. When I started in the banking business, you would get paid a small salary and hope for a turkey at the end of the year. But uh, lenders uh, went on commission. And Tom talked earlier about the Robert, uh, about Robert Morris, the evil Robert Morris. It's funny, when I started in banking, there's actually a, a, a trade association for bank lenders. It's called, it used to be called RMA the Robert Morris Associates. And uh, because Robert Morris had financed the revolution, according to, uh, according to the pamphlets. And I did a little digging, and of course I, I heard uh, Murray Rothbard give a speech about the evil Robert Morris and the fact that the revolution actually financed Robert Morris, not the other way around. <laughs> so I wrote this dandy little article about Robert Morris, the evil Robert Morris. And I don't know if this had anything to do with it, but within a couple of years, RMA changed their name. They were still RMA, but they called themselves Risk Management Associates. <laughs> but again, that's kind of silly because bank lenders weren't addressing risk at all. They were just shoveling depositor money out the door as fast as they could. So instead of making a, a salary and being careful with loan dollars, uh, bank lenders uh, began to be paid on commission. Banks wanted real estate assets. They wanted loans on their books. Uh, they wanted to grow. And so when I started in, um, in the business, uh, it quickly reverted to being paid 10% of your loan fees. And you didn't get paid when the the loan get, was paid off, you were paid your bonus when you initiated the loan, and the loan was funded. So you had every incentive to, be pay, uh, to, to seek out loans and, and make sure they got boarded. And eventually, all the banks in town paid, uh, paid bonuses. Everyone was on salary plus commission, and eventually... Uh, Portfolio maintenance was added to this, where at the end of the year you got a certain percentage uh, of the loans outstanding that you had in your uh, particular portfolio. And uh, some banks even paid as high as 12% uh, commissions on, uh, on loan fees. Uh, department heads would earn an override on, on their employee, employees under them, so... Uh, they might earn 2% of, of the loan fees generated. So everybody was after loan fees, and everybody was after um, loan generation. 
And nobody was concerned about loans being paid back because in a bubble, high tides lift all boats. Whatever silly loan you made on the book, there were plenty of greater fools to come in and either refinance the loan or or the property would get purchased. So there was no great fear that too too many loans uh, would be made. There was tremendous fear from bank managements that they would actually lose loans, that loans would pay off and they couldn't replace them. Uh, There was that constant fear that actually your bank would shrink. That would be awful. And so um, that's why those incentives were there. Now, of course, that's all changed with the with the bust, I think that uh, the price of bankers is, is going down, and I think they're going to go back to uh, making fairly modest salaries and uh, potentially a turkey at Christmas. But uh, the days of uh, the days of uh, of big commissions, I think, um, I think of, are over. But that's what's led to uh, where we are today, and. Uh, I know that we've been enjoying uh, the lap of luxury uh, here in uh, Hopperville. So um, you probably haven't kept up on the number of bank failures in the United States, but there were three more over the week weekend. So we're up to 36 banks have been shut down uh, this year. Uh, one of them is of note. Two are in Illinois, and they're relatively small banks. But one is called Bank United in Florida, and it's $12.8 billion bank. And uh, it was closed actually on a Thursday, which is unusual. Uh, banks are generally closed at 5 o'clock on Friday. But uh, Bank United in Florida was closed on a Thursday. It was turned around and sold immediately to Washington Insiders, Wilbur Ross, the Carlisle Group, and Blackstone, along with a few others. So, um, and they're going to inject 900 million uh, into this 12.8 billion dollar bank. So, uh, you can rest assured that the uh, the beat goes on. The insiders will pick up uh, more of these banks, and uh, it is estimated the FDIC fund will lose 4.9 million on this transaction. Uh, they do have a loss sharing agreement with uh, the new group that is buying it, but the Wall Street Journal estimates that the FDIC, or the taxpayer, if you will, will absorb all the losses. Now, through all this bank lending, um, we've seen, as Austrian theory would uh, tell us, uh, we've had numerous malinvestments financed. And uh, the, the most famous one that's hit the Internet lately is, uh, is Guarantee Bank of Austin. Uh, recently, um, it made YouTube that they demolished 16 new and partially built homes in Victorville, California. I don't know if you've seen that video, but uh, these were perfectly good. Uh, there were four completed homes and uh, another 12 homes that hadn't been completed. And uh, the cost um, of completing the development uh, was higher than what they could uh, ultimately receive by uh, finishing the homes and finishing the development, so they just went ahead and knocked them down. The bank did. And uh, these were homes that sold for uh, from 280000 to $350,000 uh, in 2008, probably much higher at the height of the boom. And so uh, this uh, Victorville is a bedroom community outside of uh, Los Angeles, about 50 miles away, which sounds like a long ways away, but in L.A. that's a a fairly close bedroom community. So um, here we have uh, banks that shoveled out money to real estate developers to build homes, and a few years later um, it is more cost-effective for the bank to turn around and just knock the homes down. This is not going to be an isolated case. Nearly 250 residential developments in the state of California have been mothballed, if you will, uh, totaling 9,400 homes, uh, according to one research firm. So that's one example of the malinvestments. Um, But the next shoe to drop, in my view, is commercial real estate. This would be income property, uh, shopping malls, office buildings, uh, potentially uh, casino projects. Uh, in fact, uh, 
and this is where many of the community banks, smaller banks, regional banks have really uh, made their money in the last few years. There's uh, 3,000 banks and thrifts that have commercial real estate loan portfolios that exceed 300% of their capital ratios. So um, a heavy reliance on real estate, um, you know, and Bank of America, which is considered too big to fail by the uh, Obama administration, just a couple of the uh, uh, projects that they have lent on. They've, they're the lead lender on the Fountain Blue project in Las Vegas. This is a large hotel and casino, and, of course, they had intended to sell condominiums. Uh, that project is essentially stopped. Um, and uh, Bank of America actually has funded two office projects in Buckhead, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Uh, each of those loans is $100 million, um, and those projects are going to be completed with no tenants in sight. Uh, speaking of Atlanta, there are 35 new condo projects in that city that will provide a 40-year supply of condo units, the current sales rate. So... Uh, there is plenty of pain, real estate pain, to uh, to go around, and um, we'll see how um, the bigger banks uh, weather that. You know, uh, Bill Bonner said recently, little mismanaged banks go broke, but big mismanaged banks get federal money, and with these subsidies and bailouts, the big banks get larger and live to foul up another day. And that's essentially what will happen. But Guido mentioned the uh, equity of uh, some of the big banks, and, and B of A actually has a capital ratio of 3%. So their leverage is uh, essentially 33 to 1. Um, Wells Fargo's equity capital is 3.7%. Regions Bank uh, is, uh, has a capital ratio of 5.4%. Um, so even though uh, some of the bigger banks don't have as great a real estate concentration, um, they certainly have very small equity capital ratios to protect them uh, as this onslaught of uh, defaults in the commercial real estate arena uh, come home to roost. But I would tell you, uh, community banks, uh, most of them have real estate concentrations, especially in the sand states. And uh, the Sun Belt of 80 to 90 percent. We all uh, drank from the same trough, so to speak. So um, it's uh, a very important part of the uh, financial system is the community banks. It's, you know, 20, uh, 28 to 30 percent of uh, total bank assets, and that's where a lot of the commercial real estate has been uh, done. Now, you may have read that uh, some of the bigger banks had good first quarters, that they're making money, uh, everything's okay. And, uh, in fact, uh, B of A announced earnings in the first quarter of $4.2 billion. However, um, a, a, upon closer inspection, equity investment income includes uh, $1.9 pre-tax sale of uh, the China Construction Bank, and then they had a non-interest income of $2.2 billion in gains related to mark-to-market adjustments on certain Merrill Lynch structured notes as a result of capital spreads widening. widening. So actually, um, when you uh, take out all of, uh, all of that nonsense, actually, uh, they actually showed a, showed a loss. So... Um, and the other big banks are, are no different. Um, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin uh, wrote in the uh, New York Times, with Goldman Sachs, the disappearing month of December didn't quite disappear. Um, J.P. Morgan reported a dazzling profit, partly because the price of its bonds dropped. Theoretically, they could retire them and buy them back at a cheaper price. That's sort of like saying you're richer because the value of your home has dropped. City, city group pulled the same trick. So we have all kinds of, we have all kinds of accounting tricks that uh, really have uh, created any sort of profits that have happened with the big banks in, in the first quarter. Of course, we can all be, uh, we can all be thankful that they were stress test. Um, 
and uh, Obama says that none of the big banks will be allowed to fail, and uh, so everything will be okay. But a number uh, of people question those stress test results. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, the stress testing was actually negotiated by uh, the banks. They negotiated the results with the uh, stress testers, and uh, so it, it really calls into question um, just uh, how much stress these banks uh, could take. What's interesting is with all these failures, uh, we've got so many banks failing that uh, government watchdogs who, uh, by law, have to, resu- uh, they have to review these failures. Anytime there's more than a $25 million failure within a bank, they must be um, uh, examined by the inspector general. And uh, that threshold is just too low, according to the inspector uh, general. He testified the other day that... Uh, uh, his office had not had to do only five f- uh, failed bank reviews from 1991 to 2007. They've already closed down 36 banks this year, and uh, all of them uh, uh, will be over that $25 million threshold. And so uh, his staff says that they just can't keep up with that. He would like to increase that threshold to $300 million or $500 million. And uh, that also goes for uh, closing down uh, banks. Uh, There would be many more bank failures than the 36 if the FDIC had the staff to close down banks. In fact, I've heard that if they had the staff, they would be closing down five to six banks a week. But uh, they just don't have the staff to do it. So this is going to take uh, take many years to unfold. but the, the government has come to the bankers' rescue. Last, uh, last fall's panic, uh, the, uh, the Fed wheeled out the money market investor funding facility, the asset bank commercial paper money market uh, mutual fund liquidity facility. It raised the ceiling on insured deposits from $100,000 to $250,000, guaranteed new debt issuance of the banks, thrifts and holding companies that provided full insurance for any and all non-interest bearing deposits and the treasury issued a blanket guarantee of money market liabilities. So uh, as is always the case, um, when banks get in trouble, uh, the government rides to the rescue to, uh, with the idea of taking care of uh, the poor depositor, but in fact it props up uh, the very banks that... Uh, got in trouble. Now, Murray Rothbard pointed out um, that in the absence of central bank intervention, you know, these bank panics would be very healthy. Uh, they'd be very healthy on a check on inflation in the, in the banking system, and that would certainly be the case uh, in, this, uh, in this meltdown. Uh, as these assets are written down and as these banks fail, uh, we would uh, see the pressure of inflation uh, would uh, be greatly curtailed, but uh, the Fed is uh, valiantly fighting to reinflate. In fact, it's increased its balance sheet 140 uh, percent just to generate a 14 percent increase in M1 money supply. So uh, the bank is uh, the central bank uh, has pulled out all the stops. Uh, Chairman Bernanke has um, has done everything, but uh, uh, send out the helicopters, uh, dropping uh, bales of money, although he has said uh, in previous speech years ago that uh, uh, he would be willing to do that. Um, but uh, Jim Grant from Grant's Interest Rate Observer uh, estimates that the federal response to the current downturn is 12 times greater than that of the Great Depression. So we've seen central bank intervention Uh, like we've never seen it before. But some people believe that it's not enough. In fact, the Financial Times reports that the existence of a Federal Reserve, uh, there's a staff memorandum within the the Federal Reserve that makes the case for a negative 5% Fed funds rate. Now, it's hard to cut rates below zero. It's very difficult. 
But, uh, and I quote here, however, the staff research suggests the Fed should maintain unconventional policies to provide stimulus roughly equivalent to an interest rate of minus 5%. So uh, imagine if they're able to uh, unleash that kind of uh, power. So so although ostensibly it's been uh, dodgy real estate loans that are uh, bringing all the banks down, whether it be subprime mortgages or construction loans or land loans, whatever it may be, what it really is is the fraudulent nature of fractionalized banking. And what Murray called the pernicious and inflationary domination of the state. That's the real culprit. Now, when things go bad, the regulators always go into a bank and they say the bank is operating in an unsound and unsafe manner. But what is really unsound and unsafe is fractionalized banking, the lending out of embezzled deposits. Thank you.